Very glad to see this a good turnout. Uh, have any of you been into been in the talk of Chiron or a few other related work uh, on this system? Good. Then I, I'm going to skip some of the details, okay? Because this talk is going to be very big. It's not going to be on a particular algorithm or a particular problem. But going to try to visit a, a big spectrum or landscape of machine learning and talk about how to address many of the common problems we encounter when deploying these machine learning algorithms to different problems. So let me give you a very, very quick motivation first. By the way, I'm going to focus on the algorithmic and interface of big learning, but as you can see, it actually involves you know, materials and topics even beyond that. So there has been a few years you know, for the hype of a big data, you probably all are aware about, right? So people are talking about big data, being even a form of a currency that uh, you know, can be sold for money or can be priced. And uh, you know, there is a great hope that uh, this big data can generate a lot of value and a lot of function and a lot of capability for people. Um, but uh, you know, I'd like to remind you that uh, this uh, you know, hype must be uh, taken with some caution because you know, for example, large volume of data is not a new thing you know, to many people, especially in the science domain. In this picture, you know, the biologists actually saw a form of big data you know, almost more than a decade ago. And the first reaction they react to this kind of flux of data is that, what can I do with that? Or what should I look for? And, uh, and what kind of information can be useful? In fact, people were perplexed at that point about uh, you know, how and what you know, to do with this big data. And uh, also, you know, in the ways the you know, ever increasing and the improvement of uh, data caption capability nowadays in different domain, you see big data in all these different places. Have them already turned into money? My guess is that it's probably not. Even from the latest example of this uh, you know, uh, Malaysian aircraft you know, crashing accident, you know, you know, later people find out, I mean, in fact, data has been collected you know, in various different ways. But uh, from what I heard in you know, from big companies like Boeing or other you know, manufacturers, they've been collecting data you know, for decades. And uh, rarely are these data being turned into real use. Usually you looked into the data when there is an accident or there is a crash. And uh, there hasn't been you know, a good practice on how to make use of this data. So for that purpose, you know, we need to ask, you know, what should we do with big data and how we can make them more valuable and effective. And here I want to turn, you know, remind you, you know, a, a, a sentence I, I liked very much from a philosopher called George Berkeley, who said the following. He says that uh, you know, if you are you know, in front of a big forest, and if there is a tree falling in the forest, unless you, know, you see that tree falling, you don't actually realize that falling event will make a sound to you, or you actually are knowing something is happening. What does this translate to? It means that data itself may not directly transfer knowledge unless you look into data and uh, find what you need. And that's actually not an easy task, right? Because the data volume is very big, you immediately run into a, uh, a fundamental issue about how to make the computing, the storage, the transmission, the interpretation happen in the rapid way. And in fact, there are problems even beyond that. So here I'm going to quickly point to you some of the technical challenges that we face when we first encounter big data. The first one, of course, is very obvious. You know, you, people are talking about the big data being big, and here is an example. For example, if you are interested in analyzing the social network in Facebook, you have to deal with their data size problem. The problem, the data now is already covering you know, about uh, a billion people, and uh, even neglecting all the information, every information for, for, from these uh, this people, you need to at least deal with the graph with uh, a billion node and uh, the edges among them. This is a very big data set. And uh, the very storage and the transmission of this data is already a problem, not along computing issues. Right? But beyond the size of the data, there actually are other more important issues, if uh, not more difficult. For example, nowadays to do sophisticated learning, uh, a, uh, you know, a, you know, a standard algorithm such as k-means or k-nearest neighbor may not be good enough. You need to really have sophisticated models. And here is one of them, right? You know, people are talking about uh, deploying very, very large-scale deep neural network in understanding even small data, just a small set of images which can be stored already in one computer. You still need a very large model for that. And the model can be as large as uh, having a few billion parameters. How can we actually do efficient inference with that model? That's actually an open problem. And there is actually a third dimension which is even more neglected, which is the space of the task that you are interested in. You know, when we talk about classification or clustering you know, in machine learning classes, 
We're talking about maybe a binary classification. And sometimes when we talk about multi-way or multi-task classification, we might be interested in maybe a dozen classes or maybe a few dozen classes. But if you talk to the real industrial guy or even you know, some of the you know, other users in defense or in entertainment domain, they were interested in classification problem with uh, millions of labels or even billions of labels. Imagine if you have a classification problem with millions of labels, how can you drive your binary classification algorithm to yield that kind of answer? Are you going to cut the, you know, deploy this uh, decision service a million times into different positions in that feature space and then get a summation, a summarization from that data? This is just not you know, possible statistically and computationally. Right? So there are many other problems that is going to you know, affect, affect your you know, ability to deal with big data. So now I'm asking, how can we actually put this uh, whole puzzle together and to come up with a more systematic and hopefully more efficient answer? So here you have uh, all the problems. And uh, you know, the best thing that machine learning people are good at is to come up with uh, many different fancy models, especially those advanced ones, which are mathematically very sophisticated. And then you're going to hopefully run such an algorithm you know, with a highly specialized implementation on different hardware systems. That's typically what people do. And then when you are asking to make it big and fast, in fact, different people will have very different approaches. So this is a typical practice, for example, what machine learning people like to do. We want to basically be very smart about designing our algorithm to come up with a better and a better and a better, you know, fast algorithms. And you can see, you know, uh, you know, you know, you know, movements from uh, gradient to stochastic gradient, and making the function to be more and more easy to deal with. You know, for example, having a proximal, you know, function to, you know, smooth the originally undifferentiable loss function, and so on and so forth. And what they do is to essentially drive this vehicle faster and faster, but not necessarily, you know, in concert with the system. They usually are showing the performance game on a single computer, maybe a high-end one, and at the end of the day, they say, I, they say, I beat everybody else. But, uh, you know, from my own experience of practicing this game, which I actually do myself all the time, is that uh, when I show this kind of idea to a big company like uh, Google or Facebook, they somehow laughed at me because they say, well, I have not only one computer, but I have uh, 10,000 computers. Do you really want me to shut down the other 9,099 and leave that one on and run your algorithm, or do you want to do the, the, the other way? So in industry, people like this, they're going to maybe turn a stupid algorithm, but um, you know, put it on many, many machines and let them run in parallel. Maybe on each computer, every algorithm is not ideal, but because they have so many machines, okay, they hope things can run faster. So which stance should we take? You know, which one is better? It is actually unclear. In fact, if you look at the state-of-the-art machine learning and the system research, these two ways of dealing with big data problems are not necessarily talking to each other very often. So on the uh, left-hand column, you see a typical you know, uh, you know, you know, very uh, fashionable practice you know, in machine learning where we publish papers on smart algorithms. Especially uh, nowadays, we publish smart algorithms on parallel algorithms. And in many of these algorithms, there is a magical sentence, say, you know, I decompose you know, uh, sophisticated uh, functions and the steps into simpler ones, and then there is this one point I can make things parallel. And then there is this sentence saying, let's do parallel update of some states, some variables, some something. And then I'm going to prove you that uh, if the parallelization is uh, returning me to an answer as expected, I'm going to show you that things are converging, everything is OK. okay? However, it is uh, very rarely studied that uh, how this can happen. And does it, what if it doesn't happen as you wish? Okay, if you see actually many of the papers in Nips and Samuel, you know, in fact, I read one of these papers, actually a few of these papers, I didn't even find a machine configuration of the so-called parallel experiment. And later I figured out that it is actually a sequential simulation of the parallel experiment, you know, with uh, multiple threads uh, that is running in sequence. But uh, they will be pretending that uh, they are running independently, therefore I'm having a virtual parallelization, and at the end of the day I'm going to converge as expected. 
This is not going to happen actually in a real system. Your algorithms are likely to fail if you really deploy them to a real system because in a real system, there are all kinds of weird things that can happen. You lose a computer at some point, your communication get clogged by some bursty communications and stuff like that. What do you do? Right? So these questions are not often addressed in our machine learning domain. On the other hand, in the system domain, there is also a movement toward processing big computing, especially with simple algorithms. And over there, the style is a little bit uh, uh, unfamiliar to us. What they worry about is to really push as much as they can the throughput of the computing. They want to really distribute, for example, the whole thing into many machines, such as, you know, let's say I run a deep neural network, I'm going to cut them into pieces and put them into different machines, and hopefully, you know, when they run parallel, they can still give me something interesting. And in those cases, you will see a lot of uh, uh, throughput you know, happening in the system. But uh, there is uh, something lacking, okay? It's very rarely that people ask, is the whole thing converging or not? Converging to the right point? And uh, do we have a guarantee on the error bound and stuff like that? So in a sense, these two domains you know, are starting talking to each other, but not so intensively. What I'm going to show you today is an uh, effort that is uh, taking place in our group for the past uh, few you know, years, not, not too many years, one or two years, in building this uh, platform called uh, Petrum, which is to hopefully you know, cultivating a practice that uh, system, algorithm, theory, model, even data processing are happening in concert so that uh, they can yield a general, a general purpose framework for practicing large scale machine learning. And this very system is built on some very fundamental insight uh, in how to deal with big data. And here I'm going to use this graph to give you a glimpse of what that insight is. So as I mentioned, the bigness can, can come in different way. Size of the data, size of the model, size of the task, and many other things. And uh, to make them manageable, even with big size, you know, one idea is to make them parallel. So obviously you can go data parallel, model parallel, and task parallel. Strangely enough, this different parallelism, you know, even though I name them very differently, you know, may look very similar or identical to a person who does not appreciate the subtlety in machine learning. Because when the data enters the memory of a machine, they are all just digits. They didn't tell you whether I am model, I am data, or I am task. But actually this different type of parallelism can be, you know, in asking for very different properties of support from both algorithmic and the system perspective. And here I give you one example. For example, let's look at this uh, typical update function that is uh, often seen in many machine learning. I emphasize that this is not necessarily just a, you know, a gradient method for log logistic regression or linear regression. It could be even the update of the entire model over a big graphical model or any other you know, multivariate optimization function. And the basic operation is that you are going to update where you are, uh, where you were, using a, you know, this increment, which are computed from a large data. And here, the bigness actually can be reflected in the size of the data, the dimension of this uh, parameter or, ve or, or, or state vector, and also this uh, function. Okay? And uh, then you can see the following type of uh, parallelism. One way is to now cut data into pieces and put them onto different machines, or maybe they were already on different machines so that you don't have to copy and paste. And then you're going to you know, let each machine to do a local update and then aggregate, and hopefully they generate the right update that you are going to use for updating the whole model. That's called data parallelism. And in here, you can quickly detect that there's this uh, very important statistical assumption we have to make, which is that the ID needs between data points, so that you can have maybe a central point to receive all the updates from different places. And uh, these different updates may not have a strong need for being synchronized. On the other hand, if we are talking about model parallelism, it is really mean that uh, we have to now cut this uh, big state in the parameter vector or the state vector into pieces to make them subvectors, and each subvector can be updated from either the whole data or the piece of data. And remember that uh, usually when we talk about the big graphical model or big convex program, you know this uh, you know partitioning of the parameters will generate a loss of dependency and therefore you know a source of potential error. Therefore, you have to deal with them carefully to maybe make sure that the ordering or the way they're going to be congregated 
should be you know, taken care of carefully. Right? So therefore, this one and this one is different. And then, of course, there are task parallelism, which I want to spend less time on. You know, you have, uh, say, a multi-way classification problem, and different classifiers may be coupled if you are talking about a tree hierarchy of class labels. And uh, therefore, you know, to really you know, enable large-scale machine learning, it is not really about uh, just developing maybe a operating system which uh, can take care of uh, in a more effective communication between different uh, machines, or deriving a algorithm which can run very fast on a high power computer, or maybe derive a theorem which show that uh, in the ideal case, some algorithm when distributed or broken into pieces can still converge. It is really the totality of the whole thing. Okay? You have to start from the very basics of uh, identifying what kind of hardware you're going to use, GPU or CPU, what is the memory limit, what is the communication bandwidth limit, and then develop the right communication protocol on top of it, hopefully virtualize the lower layer, and then put the right algorithm on top of that, and then go with the theory to analyze whether it is correct or not. And that's what it takes to really do the right big data and big machine learning. So in the next uh, few tens of minutes, I'm going to use uh, three examples to show you exactly how does that map to some practical problems we actually care about and uh, some of the progress we made over the development of the system and the algorithm and in some cases the theory about uh, you know, this practice. So let me begin with uh, uh, the problem of data parallelism. So, that means that the data is too big to be stored in one machine, or even if it can be stored, you still want them to be partitioned so that you can gain you know, a speed up just by parallelizing the computing task. And here, I want to use this problem as example because it is really big. Okay. This is the problem of doing network uh, you know, uh, member, you know, membership in, uh, inference of uh, you know, network uh, actors in a big social network. And uh, imagine this is uh, a chunk of the Facebook network and I want to understand this guy's uh, social functions in a multi-dimensional space. For example, that dimension, uh, that the social rows, social multi-rows can be maybe described by this uh, pie chart, which tells you the fraction of uh, involvement of this guy in different activities, say uh, being a professional person, being a family person, or being a playmate of someone else. Right. And this problem is very big because the social network can have uh, billions of nodes. And uh, of course, there are tons of utilities for this, which I'm not going to elaborate. So how should we start with? You will realize that even the very representation of uh, the data can affect the effectiveness of your solving a problem. Because if you, for example, represent the big social network as an adjacency matrix, you know, that directly captures the network topology, it is going to already bring you into trouble. Because that network will be, and that matrix will be one million or one billion times one billion matrix, which is nowhere to store. Now you ask, why do I need that matrix? The matrix will be very sparse, many of which are zero. And if you build a model for generating this matrix, you actually need to spend a lot of time, hopefully not very useful, on generating those zeros. Right? So that obviously already asking for a need for reinventing a more informative representation, which focus yourself more on the interaction, not the non-interaction. Therefore, uh, in one of Chiron's paper, uh, he developed this uh, new representation called the uh, triangular motif, which in a, in a nutshell tries to give you, you know, a, uh, a contextual representation of the, you know, of the uh, connectivity of individuals, okay? in which you focus more on the edges and the way they're interacting, but uh, also the non-edges only when they are occurring in the context of other edges. You don't actually are in, you're not interested in an empty triangle with no edges at all, or just uh, all the zeros indifferently. Right? So with this new representation, you can hope that every individual is not represented by you know, the kind of triangles he is involved with, like this one, like this one, and that one. And just like the edges, you know, under a mixed membership stochastic problem model, this kind of triangle representation also gives you mixed membership information in terms of uh, the different social roles that he is involved with. So for this kind of data, now you can develop a slightly more interesting and more informative you know, uh, mixed membership model, which is called the mixed membership triangular model, you know, whose graphic representation is presented here, to build a generative process of the data, which is now a triangle, not an edge. So I'm not going to spend time to you 
can uh, articulate the very design of this model, but just to realize that this is uh, almost like putting together a topic model in triplet. You have now you know, three documents to be modeled at the same time to you know, allow you generating a triangle between three people. And the task, of course, is to infer these are social roles of each individual, which can be in very high dimensional space. Imagine you are now modeling a billion people network, then a social role of four or five is not going to be enough. It's too cost green, right? And then, of course, you have to learn the parameters in this model. And this is a pretty non-trivial task, but not uh, too unfamiliar to us, right? So for machine learning people, we see this uh, these kind of models all the time, especially in your 701, 708 other classes. So what's the biggest, what's the you know, direct algorithm we use to deal with that? Well, here I named two of them. Hopefully you are all familiar with. One is the MCMC algorithm. The other is the stochastic version inference algorithm. And uh, essentially they run the same operation, right? They touch every hidden variable sequentially and they estimate uh, either the and uh, the, 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 uh, some representation or approximation to the latent states, you know, conditioning on the same thing of the neighboring nodes, and you do it cyclically. But remember now, you have a very big network, which means that you may have uh, billions of such latent variables for you to visit in every iteration. Therefore, you know, sequentially visiting all of them and uh, in many iterations is, of course, out of question, right? But anyway, for machine people who are not familiar with parallel computing, we still can you know, try to design better algorithms to make uh, this sequential visit very fast. So here I show you a few ideas. That's essentially what we did in the past few years before we turned ourselves into the parallel computing domain. So here are some ideas you may be familiar with. One is called a delta subsampling. You're going to, you know, in the case of a big network, not looking at all your neighbors, but a subset of neighbors. Hopefully that uh, what you counted is still statistically representative of the true neighborhood. That gives you a fraction of saving. And the second dimension could be that uh, maybe at every iteration you don't have to visit all the nodes. You can basically maybe sample a subset of nodes and hopefully that uh, once you have enough iteration, every node will be eventually visited multiple times and your statistic can be still representative, right? And the third dimension could be, well, you can maybe um, do some smart addition of the model design to make them more parsimonious, to clamp away redundant variables, to hopefully tie together uh, dependent random variables and so on and so forth. And you can eventually reduce the size of the, the model space. So with all that, actually I have a few more tricks to do variance control, to do automatic learning of learning rates and so on and so forth. And this all can bring you actually quite far. So how far it can bring us? Well, you are basically improving yourself from a wagon to a train to a plane to a rocket now. So how far it can go? Here is uh, where we can go. So originally, when start with this uh, quadratically complex stochastic <coughs> mixed membership block, stochastic block model, Okay, and which is known to be unscalable because it is quadratic, with the, you know, the uh, Gibson clay version of the triangular motif model, we can actually make them to linear and even bring down the slope of the linearity okay, to make them reasonably scalable to the point that we can now deal with a network of a quarter million nodes with a few tens of hours, which you know, can be considered as remarkable you know, from a pure machine learning perspective. Usually because we talk about uh, you know, latent variable inferences for network, we're talking about a network of a few thousand nodes. Mm -hmm. Here we're talking about a quarter million in a few hours, which is not bad. And you can even push further by you know, switching to a stochastic variational inference algorithm and, uh, you know, and with all the ideas of uh, making stochastic updates, you can push them down to you know, even a few minutes for a network of uh, a quarter million nodes. Of course, here you are going to assume the number of social rows to be only five, but if you increase it to a reasonable size, say 20, maybe you can still okay. So with all these tricks, we were able to, you know, scale up the operation, uh, maybe by two order of magnitude. Is that good enough or not? Well, it is good enough for us to publish a fancy paper in NIPS. You know, we published multiple papers in NIPS on this. But uh, it is not good enough if you want to bring this to Facebook people. Because what they will worry about is a problem of this scale. They can give you maybe uh, one-tenth of their network, not even the entire thing, which is uh, 100 million, right? But on the other hand, they really want to have more roles because they want to do sophisticated, targeted advertisements. You know, two rows and five rows for such a big population <laughs> is uh, out of question, right? So they want, for example, a row of, you know, a size of uh, maybe 10,000 rows. So how, how does that translate to in terms of computing? Well, the very storage of the representation of all these uh, inference 
the data analytics that you want to infer from the data will be this big. It is a few terabytes, you know, exceeding the size of a single machine for sure. In terms of timing, you can actually do some little calculation on the back of your envelope, and you will realize that even with the fattest algorithm I just talked about, it will take you a few years to actually finish such analysis. Okay, therefore, you know, from my opinion, you know, the machine learning kind of uh, avenue is coming to an end. You really, can, you know, maybe we're not smart enough, but uh, we tried very hard already, and we couldn't really go even further, because uh, on a single computer, it's just, there is a limit for that. So now, the next question is to ask, okay, you know, yeah, we have multiple computers, even in our campus, you know, shall we just do this? Let's maybe, uh, you know, uh, try to distribute it my uh, sample task into different clients, and uh, uh, then I'm going to, you know, follow this, uh, you know, map reduce idea to reduce them. You know, I, I do the map first, and then I reduce them to an aggregator, and then I can iterate. Hopefully, that wouldn't be causing me too much trouble. So, you know, you can basically write this uh, micro to hope that these uh, parallel updates can happen as you wish. But in reality, that is not necessarily the case. But as Chiron pointed out in one of his earlier talks, you know, you have all these weird things happen, you know, in a computer cluster, you know, and I'm going to show you some fancy pictures later. But uh, you can imagine, you know, machine can, you know, be, you know, you know, just uh, at will, you know, going offline, and the congestions can happen all the time. And also, there are other users on the computer, not only you, and uh, you cannot predict their behavior. Sometimes they decide to take over the whole bandwidth with a higher priority task. What if that happens, right? So you need to now be a little bit smart because you want to make sure the algorithm is correctly conducted. There is an internal you know, sequentiality between different states. You cannot jump the later stage to an earlier time point. Therefore, you need to set up barriers so that uh, you wait until all the messages come into a place and then you aggregate them. And that barrier can actually hurt you tremendously if you are not careful because uh, it is very typical that uh, for a regular cluster, as I actually show in here, you know, maybe 80% or even more of the time will be spending on those communications and waiting, you know, versus the actual computing you are going to use on every client. And this is because, uh, you know, the machine can, you know, be faulty and uh, they can be vibrating, you know, you know due to some reason. Uh, maybe a fan is going out of order on one of these machines. Maybe the temperature in the cold room is not even. And all this actually will hurt the uniform performance of uh, all these different clients. Therefore, you are going to be likely you know, in this situation. And as a result, you know, your distributed computing can go very bad, and so bad that it can be even sometimes slower than a single machine operation on sequential operations. And uh, so how people deal with uh, data parallelism? Well, nowadays, there are two main styles of doing with that in the domain of data parallelism. One is about the BSP, which actually is called the bulk synchronous parallelization. You just do this uh, Hadoop map reduce type of practice, you know, send job out, wait until everything come back, and aggregate and resend. And you can always realize that there is a, uh, you know, a big opportunity for you to waste your time you know, in those waiting and communication. But of course, the good thing about this is that it ensures your correctness of the execution. It always gives you a right answer. On the other hand, if you are not uh, happy enough with all this uh, waiting happening in this uh, white space and red space, you may go async and uh, just let uh, every client go at their own pace. And uh, they can you know, update you know, maybe a centralized uh, model you know, in, the, in the key value store at, at any point in any way. And in that case, you really gain computational throughput. You can push a lot of uh, clock cycle you know, computing happen, you know, and because there are no time wasted for any communication. But uh, the, se the sequence, uh, the, se the messages from different clients can be in such, you know, uh, you know out of order, so that uh, they may generate, uh, you know, inconsistency and eventually cause a non-convergence of the algorithm. So what we are asking uh, in our first attempt to try solving this uh, data parallel optimization question <laughs> is to you know, explore a domain which we call the partial synchronization, which actually was talked about by Chiron in a few days ago, uh, in which we can actually give you a system that allows you to you know, control the degree of asynchronism between different clients. And the main idea is to now you know, you know, set up you know, an iteration count, a counter you know, on every client and on the server, so that every individual client can hold their partial data and do their updates 
you know, locally without always communicating with the parameter server or with uh, a central place where the model parameters are visible and stored for all the clients. Because whenever, if you want to read that and write that, every time you update, you will generate a lot of uh, communication traffic. And what it does here is that it is doing a still synchronous parallelism where I'm going to read from a local copy of the parameters as much as I can until I'm told that my version is too old. Then I'm going to update my version. And by this buffer, you are going to hopefully reduce the amount of communications between the clients and the server. And this procedure is known as a parameter server procedure built on the SSP instrumentation. Of course, you know, until this point, you may say, okay, that's a good idea. Therefore, I'm going to practice the parallelism in my implementation. I'm going to write MPI code or maybe other communication code to you know, allow my algorithm to do you know, uh, this kind of uh, you know, utilization of the client and of the system. This is what indeed what a sophisticated engineer can do. What we figure is that maybe most machine learning people don't really want to do that. You know, how many of you guys have been written MPI code or anything lower level? Not too much, right? Not too many. Maybe most of you like to write, good, good for you, and I, I, I hope you can keep doing that. But I guess <laughs> most people, including myself, uh, spending most of our time doing, you know, MATLAB programming, okay, maybe at most Python and Java programming, not necessarily go to that level. And for those people, they may want to have uh, a programming interface uh, which can virtualize this uh, whole distributed environment so that uh, you can treat the, the distributed memory as if you are running with a single memory. So for that purpose, we built uh, this uh, parameter server, which uh, is logically a separate entity on a server machine, but it can be physically deployed on different machines as well. And then it is going to be interfacing with the different clients using a very, very simple interface. It is like, suppose this is a table that stores all the parameters or all the latent states for your model. Then in the, you know, in a sequential single machine environment, you are going to read and write to this table using this sentence. And in our case, you just put a PS from the server, you know, you know, you know, a note in front of that, and you do the same operation. And what's happening is that it is going to take care of that still asynchronous update between the clients and the server. And we emphasize that this interface is generic for not only one machine program, but for multiple. And here is, for example, the abstraction you can take advantage of, you know, for many of the machine learning models that we deal with, such as a LDA, you know, a matrix factorization, a logistic regression, you name it. Usually, you know, you can clearly see there is this bipartite and kind of, uh, you know, nature where the parameters is uh, to be shared across all the data points, and the data points will be used in a digital fashion to update the parameters. And in this case, you are going to now store all these shared parameters into this uh, SSP table, and then the interface that I just presented will take, take care of a smarter updates and hopefully communication effective of uh, uh, this uh, particular learning process. So without running into the details, I'm going to show you some benefit as a result of this practice. For example, when I'm using more and more stillness, meaning that I allow each client to read less and less from the central server before they found themselves to be too outdated. You know, you can now spend more and more fraction of time in the real computing and the less time on the communication. And this is a drop down of the ratio between the communication and the computing time, you know, on different uh, degree of stillness. And uh, I emphasize that uh, this benefit is not only for just a specific machine learning program. Here, we intentionally chose three different re very representative class of machine learning programs. LDA, which represents latent space probabilistic model. LASSO, which represents convex optimization. And the matrix factorization, which is by itself a large class of computing. You can see that this uh, curve is going in a similarly, where the SSP you know, uh, updates getting you to the convergence faster and better. And all people ask, you know, does this also scale with the number of machines? You know, maybe you show it good on two machines. What about I have eight machines or 10 machines? So this is a graph showing you the behavior of this uh, you know, accelerated convergence on different number of machines, going all the way from uh, one machine, eight core, which is you know, a multi-thread, multi-core programming, to 32 machines with uh, 256 cores on here. And uh, here is another way. If you just uh, set, set maybe at a particular uh, level of uh, likelihood target, then you can see that achieving that target 
you know, on different number of machines is going to require you linearly decreasing amount of time. Okay. So that's basically giving you, you know, a rough estimate about the benefit you can get by adding machines. We empirically, we found that uh, whenever you add one machine, you are going to get, uh, you know, whenever we double the machine, you are going to get 78% uh, increment of the performance, which is not bad. It is not as good as two, but, you know, you still get a good, uh, you know, uh, recovery of the benefit. Another important uh, benefit or advantage of uh, this SSP procedure is that it is not built on a clever heuristic. It actually is built on a fundamental analysis of the properties of machine learning algorithms that we want to support. And it actually offers a very good theoretical uh, convergence support. And uh, here is the insight of uh, why it is theoretical sound. Basically, you are doing a you know, update of model parameters now in a less than exact sense, which basically means that now you are computing the gradient or whatever updates you call it from a less perfect version, which may be deviating from the optimal step. Now we have this abundant stillness in which we say that uh, every client shouldn't be out of sync from the main server you know, by a certain number of stillness, which essentially translating to saying that uh, this uh, you know, deviation should be upper bounded by a limit. And that's actually how we can guarantee still the convergence of the eventual algorithm. And uh, here is the insight I just mentioned about. And here is the form of the, of the, of the bound. You can see that this is a very interesting bound, which now incorporates uh, you know, F and L, which are you know, Lipschitz coefficients of the you know, uh, smoothness of the function and the diameters of the data in L, which are intrinsic to machine learning, which is the typical type of uh, you know, quantities we include in our you know, error bound in machine learning proofs. But here you see other numbers. P is the number of machines or the degree of parallelism you want to use in a parallel system. And S is the degree of stillness you know, in those uh, in synchronization. So you can see this is an interesting analysis which shows you how to integrate you know, improvement from the machine learning direction and improvement from the system direction and put them together to hopefully you know, multiply their advantage. We have actually even more analysis which want to bypass, which actually tells you that not only the error is bounded at mean, but also the variance and the, you know, uh, the convergence, uh, the shape of the convergence path is also bounded so that they actually are behaving nicely even at uh, the convergence uh, region, meaning that they are not oscillating a lot you know, in, uh, even under a stochastic update environment. And uh, just to wrap up this uh, data parallel session, let me give you just uh, one highlight of uh, uh, the results. You know, we were able to now eventually deal with that uh, very big social network I mentioned earlier, now in a really big size. So here we have two experiments. One is meant to be compared with an existing implementation because, uh, you know, thanks to other researchers' effort, it can be now dealt with under the traditional approach with a reasonable size. So here I have a program. Uh, thing coming from uh, the algorithm called uh, AMSSB, uh, developed by David Bly's group. They were able to analyze a network of 4 million nodes in 24 hours. And uh, in our case, you know, we were able to get it done in three hours. And then I really want to push it bigger, so now we have experiment on 40 million nodes. Okay. Uh, in that case, uh, the other program or any other program even failed to load the pro problem because it is just too big for them to even start. And we were still able to get things done in a few hours. Right, that's basically uh, what I want to uh, report on the data parallelism side. Now moving to the next parallelism, which is uh, model parallelism. This is a very interesting uh, actually domain which uh, received, I would say, less attention in machine domain because uh, you know, it is uh, not quite uh, implicit if we were talking about uh, big data. You know, right? This is about big model. So why we need big model? As I mentioned, you know, deep neural network is of course a big model. But even for simpler models, sometimes it can be still very big. So here is a problem I studied for a few years on genetics, which is called a genome association. And in here, in the simplest case, you want to basically find a regression function from uh, maybe a few million tra uh, genetic uh, variations to a few tens of thousands of uh, gene expression or other traits. And that basically translates to, in the simplest case, estimating a coefficient matrix of uh, maybe 10 to the 6 by 10 to the 6, which is, again, easily translated into a few billion parameters. And this is very big. 
And in addition to estimating that, you may want to also add some shrinkage function to control the sparsity and so on and so forth. So that all translates to a gigantic convex optimization problem. If it can be, you know, you can also make it non-convex if you want to add latent variables and stuff like that. So what's the answer to this kind of problem? Well, you'll probably see that in the recent years, there's a huge literature in developing acceleration procedures for convex optimization. And here, actually, even our group contributed a few. We had an algorithm called uh, alternating direction dual decomposition, which helps you to decouple overlapping constraints into non-overlapping one so that you can take a derivative directly out of it. And uh, if the loss function is non-smooth, we have another idea called uh, proximal gradient to turn non smooth so that you can still derive a gradient or subgradient. And uh, if you have a lot of constraints, say, uh, again, you know, in typical you know, academic machine learning problems, when we talk about uh, constraint optimization, we have maybe a few thousand constraints, a few hundred constraints, which can be you know, stored in our memory and uh, you know, checked you know, one by one in every iteration. But in the real genetics problem, you may have uh, tens of millions of such constraints. Therefore, in every iteration, if you check them all, that's probably not an option. But you, know, you can be smarter about uh, you know, building a dependency structure on top of all these constraints <laughs> to you know, take advantage of the redundancy they may have to reduce the amount of checks. So with all these tricks, you know, we were able to push down the complexity curve from uh, this uh, almost a vertical line to a line with uh, a reasonable slope to a line with a very low slope and so on. We are good. But uh, on the other hand, if you want to zoom into this graph and really look at how high this bar is, it is actually not trivial. Because here I was uh, pushing to a few thousand dimension. And if this line is going this far and go to a few billion dimension, that time is still very prohibitive. Okay? So naturally, you know, this uh, particular strategy may come to an end. You really want to put multiple rockets, and hopefully they run together to the same target. And how should we do that? So here I want to use this a very simple example that everybody is doing to inspire our very design. So this is a lasso problem which uh, asks you to estimate a sparse version of this beta. And in our case, we want to estimate a very high dimensional version of the beta. How high? Well, it could be a million, uh, 100 million dimensional. I'm not joking. This kind of 1 million, 100 million dimensional is very, very frequently seen. Okay. I was told that in Facebook and in Google, they were talking about uh, a few tens of billions of dimensional regression. I didn't know how that can happen, but uh, that's what they did. Anyway, so how to actually do this uh, uh, effectively? Obviously, you, you don't want to scan every parameter in this uh, vector sequentially to compute the update. That's just not of, out of question. You want to have something like this, where you have multiple cores or multiple machines, and then each of them hopefully is taking care of a subset of the coefficients and update them locally before they can conjoy and, uh, and aggregate on a single solution. But this is uh, more difficult than the data parallelism I just talked about. Because uh, all these uh, different parameters are dependent. Just uh, take uh, two coefficients as an example. You can easily derive a updated equation on each coordinate. And uh, you know, in a typical coordinate design algorithm, you're going to see this updated equation very often, which means that uh, every one coordinate is dependent on the previous version of other coordinate. And the strength of the dependency sometimes can depend on the data, okay, relevant to that particular dimension. And uh, that basically gives you a caution, which means that uh, if you naively put these uh, two coefficients into different machine and disrupt their right correct order of updates, you may run into a divergence of the algorithm. Right? And that's exactly what uh, the shotgun algorithm people probably heard about are running into. When shotgun is deployed on very large problem, naively on arbitrary data, they don't converge. So our goal is to now design a system which uh, allow us to hopefully mitigate this challenge. So here again, I want to show you the two extreme solutions nowadays in the community, you know, and uh, our uh, you know, compromise in the middle. So one way you can do it is, course, is to, of course, do the ultimate correct thing, right? Uh, like, for example, the graph lab is doing. You build a graph on top of the data. You do a graph cut or a partition to correctly distribute the whole thing into different uh, clients so that uh, maybe uh, internal dependencies between the variables in a single client is strong, but uh, uh, dependencies across the different clients can be weak so that uh, you can you know, hopefully uh, tolerate some inconsistency when you do parallel updates. So this procedure, you know, 
not, you know, not even discussing whether it is ultimately correct or not, even operationally can be very, very expensive. For example, I have a, a 100 million dimensional regression. A graph of a 100 million variable is out of question, not a long cutting that, right? And if I have uh, more data to be fit, then you know, if I want to even make every data point into a vertex of this uh, big graph program, that is even more hard. Therefore, this solution may be good, but it's too expensive. And sometimes it is not even good because uh, the structure of dependencies between covariance and uh, coefficients can be dynamic over time, depending on the data. And therefore, the structure you used before can be no longer valid in the next iteration. Right. On the other hand, you know, people just say, OK, you know, I don't want to deal with all this mess. I want to really be simple and quick and dirty. Therefore, I'm going to do random partition and distribute them, which is the idea behind the shotgun. And you know what's going to happen, right? If you're non sophisticated, some you know, uh, dependencies may caught you and, uh, and get you to a non convergent. So, what do we want to do is to develop a system which can now effectively look into the data and the model and then do a smart distribution of uh, the workload across different systems, across different clients. And this is a rough uh, skeleton of the framework. You have multiple workers. You have a scheduler sitting here, which uh, is going to you know, up, you know, schedule uh, the, the, the partition and the, and the dispatch based on the very nature of the current you know, status of the data and also the updates that you see in the previous iteration. And now, of course, we have a key value store or from the server to actually maintain a central consistent copy of the whole model you're going to learn. So with that, you can hopefully generate uh, a workflow like this. You know, different uh, workers will be taking different chunks of the job and do them in parallel. But this distribution does not have to be static. It can be changing over time in every iteration. And uh, hopefully, at the end of the day, you are going to eventually achieve a saving and a convergence at the end of the day. So what is key to this procedure is, of course, as you can imagine, the way how we partition dynamically. And also, in, you need to make them practical so that you don't have to you know, uh, look the data beforehand through a gigantic pre-processing. And then you can kick start the process, because uh, this is not only too expensive, but also maybe statistically not even correct. So what we used is the idea about uh, you know, a bootstrap procedure based on a, a empirical distribution directly defined on the current status of the data and the, the model estimation. In this case, I used Lasso again as an example. You can basically sample you know, at every iteration certain updates to be updated, a certain parameters to be updated. And a sample can be taking advantage of the magnitude of increment or decrement happened in the previous iteration. And the intuition behind that is that uh, if uh, a parameter is uh, experiencing just now a big updates, it is more likely to be a significant parameter. Therefore, chances for it to receive another significant updates is high. But if it, a parameter is already close to zero or is already pretty stable and not changing, then chances for it to be changing in the next iteration is also very small. Right. So with that, we can sample the coefficients. And once we sample a pair, we can now check based on the very data associated with that, whether they are truly dependent or not. And if they are dependent, we throw them into the same bin. If they are not dependent, we can throw them into different bins to, them, to allow them to be paralyzed. So with that, you can see a curve that is very interesting. You know, this is a convergence curve of our strats lasso and the versus shotgun. And this curve is very typical to our scheduler called strats, but very atypical in the literature, in which you see actually a multi-phase convergence. There is a slower phase, which actually happens during the initialization, which is the bootstrap phase. I'm building the empirical distribution. I'm trying to generate initial partitions of the data, of the, of the updates across the machine. And in every you can see I don't have a good picture about what's going on. Therefore, my estimation could be slow. But uh, after some point, it is massaging into the right zone. And then it is suddenly having a much quicker convergence, because now the coefficients are correctly distributed across machines. Therefore, you are going to lock into a faster convergence curve and drive down to the convergence really, really rapidly. And this is a behavior we actually saw in a number of different programs as well. LASU, matrix factorization, and LDA. They all give you this uh, interesting you know, uh, insight that uh, you know, uh, the model estimation can be parallelized. And uh, a bootstrap procedure you know, that study the patterns 
on the coefficients and on the data can be made use of to actually speed up this process. All right, so with that, I just want to showcase you how big we can achieve in solving a large model estimation problem. Again, here the advantage was gained across different models. We have a lasso, and uh, which uh, can be as big as uh, 100 million dimensional. We have a matrix factorization, which is also very big. And I'm going to tell you how, you know, what, what, in what sense it is big. And we have LDA. Maybe take LDA as an example. So here, I want to compare with the largest state-of-the-art LDA that is known. To my knowledge, it is uh, the Yahoo LDA, which was built by Amr Ahmed, who was graduated from here. I think later on, he moved to Google and built a Google LDA, which might be a little bit bigger, but not by much. And the roughly the size is uh, a 5,000 dimensional topic, a 5,000 topic, and every topic having 2.5 million tokens. Okay, it's a pretty big topic model. And uh, so we compare that with uh, uh, our implementation of the same model. You can see we are getting convergence uh, at about a half of the time. But uh, that's not the main message. The main message is in here. We now want to push the model really big, okay? To the point that we have a model with uh, 10,000 topics. And uh, in each topic, we have uh, 20 million tokens. So how can we have 20 million tokens? Remember, if you are really a language model guy, you actually want to not only use uh, you know, monogram, but also higher order language programs and uh, language models such as bigrams. So here we had some you know, interesting bigrams also included in the vocabulary. Therefore, that makes the model as big as you can. You know, if you want to have big capacity, I can make the model even bigger. But uh, nevertheless, you, know, you can see this uh, curve. We can handle even a model of this size, which is about 20 times the size of the biggest model known so far in you know, a reasonable amount of time with uh, a modest uh, cluster of uh, 62 machine, uh, 64 machines. On the matrix factorization, we also actually have a, uh, a kind of unique sense of uh, bigness. In here, the data is, uh, we use is the Netflix data, which is of two size. Many people dealt with that already. And how can we argue we have an advantage? Well, here is the difference. If you look at uh, Netflix, you know, uh, you know, collaborative filtering or other matrix factorization, there is a hidden notion that people take advantage of to make their program run fast, which is the low rankness. They say, well, intrinsically, low rank structure in your data, therefore I'm going to look into only the first few eigenvectors and keep only a few of that, and then try to drive my program faster and drive my memory consumption very low. This is uh, not necessarily a scientific reason. It is probably a computational argument. If I talk about the real data analytic what if I actually have a data set which is not low rank, which is high rank? So in this case, doing high rank matrix factorization is actually computationally very expensive. And uh, our program shows you at least you can make this happen. We have, uh, for example, an implementation for MF, which allows you to do factorization at 20,000 rank, which is, again, uh, you know, one or two order magnitude than the biggest one available so far. With that, again, we have a curve showing you the whole you know, advantage uh, can be extended you know, with uh, more and more machines to a certain limit, of course. And, uh, and uh, we also have uh, evidence showing a uh, more economic memory trace for running big program, so that when you split the program or the algorithm or the problem into more machines, every machine is going to use uh, a smaller amount of uh, memory uh, consumption. And this is important because your cluster will be shared with other users. Therefore, the more saving you make, the more kind of progress you can allow for other users. On the other hand, the Yahoo LDA, you know how they scale, right? They copy the whole thing into different machines. Therefore, even if you have more machines, your assumption will be constant. There is no way to reduce that. And uh, just to save time, I'm going to skip this part, which is a serial guarantee of uh, you know, a particular way of doing subsampling of uh, coefficients that gets you the optimum convergence point. And uh, we have also good news is from uh, using this system for implementing real large models, such as a deep neural network model. And for details, you can see our release on the website. Now I want to say a few words about the third uh, parallelism, which is a task parallelism. And in here, I'm going to use this a very simple example of uh, ImageNet classification as a driving uh, example. You know, ImageNet classification is a well-known multitask classification with uh, 2,000 uh, 20,000 labels, right? And uh, again, there are both system and the model challenges. And uh, here, I feel the model challenge may be more interesting than the system one may be a trivial one. 
So on the model challenge, you can see learning a multitask learner, you know, of this skill, you know, is a really, you know, a, a non-trivial, you know, a problem for machine learning people. If you like uh, SVM, K nearest neighbor, they probably don't work well at this scale, you know, with so many clusters, right? You will see, you know, tiny, you know, uh, data from one class and a big junk chunk of data from all the rest of the a few tens of thousands of classes and train a binary classifier in the middle. You know, you, you know what's going to happen, right? And there are sophisticated problem uh, approaches like, uh, you know, a transfer learning approach, a tree guided uh, multitask learning approaches, which we actually published a few years ago. None of this actually pushed us very, very far into a big data domain. So here there's a need for probably, you know, a out of box thinking, which uh, we actually did and found it to be surprisingly simple. Okay, it is basically asking you to do the class fiction problem completely differently as you did before. What we did before is this approach. We have multi-classes, and we're going to find the boundaries for each of the class, and then you know, combine them and uh, get uh, a solution. And what happens is that uh, you will get uh, you know, one number for the confidence of one class label. You're going to have a few tens of thousands of such labels, and the numbers are all between zero and one. You're going to say one of them is the true class. I'm going to pick them out, which is highly noisy. So what this new approach called output coding is to fundamentally redefine the way you call class label. Instead of calling a class label to be one, two, three, four, up to maybe a million or a billion, I'm going to now assign each class label a code, which is a, a binary code or maybe a trinary code of a zero, one and a zero, one, negative one, something like that. And uh, you can imagine how many bits I need to code all these classes. Roughly logarithm of C. Right. So this is a much smaller number of uh, you know, uh, bits you need to use to actually uh, do the uh, class label uh, uh, representation. Now how to train a classifier in this case? Well in this case you no longer train a classifier to predict the labels. You're going to train what we call the bit predi uh, predictors. For every new data point, you're going to now you know, sequentially apply every bit predictor to see you know, on the first bit whether it is zero or one on the second bit, whether it is zero or one, and so on and so forth, and you do it k times. At the end of the day, for every data point, you get a bit string, then you do a decoding to recover the class label. Okay. So this is a procedure which is roughly translated to, for every bit predictor, dividing the data into two chunks and train a bit predictor based on that very well balanced data, and you can do them very reliably. Of course, the design of the encoding matrix can be another uh, open problem. We have some solution to that. But the message from this kind of uh, uh, problem is that uh, here, you really can push very far by designing the right machine learning model and algorithm to start you know, uh, approaching a big problem. And then we talk about the parallelism. Actually, there are some numbers here which you know, I have no, ne no need to say that. Of course, we are better, right? So let's move on and uh, talk about how to make it bigger. Remember that every bit predictor is independently trained. Therefore, that kind of entails a, you know, a trivial, or we call the embarrassingly parallel procedure. They can use probably a Hadoop, not even a Python system, just to you know, you know, train every bit predictor separately and still enable you to go very large scale. So I think I'm almost done with the whole review of the, the Python system. And here is the message I want, to, want you guys to maybe uh, take home and digest. So from our own experience of building the general purpose, big data, big machine learning platform, we found that if you are narrowly focusing on only the algorithmic issue, or the modeling issue, or the system issue, you cannot go very far. There is a need for you to understand information and the subtlety on all this domain, and try to make sure that they can take advantage of each other. For example, here, for machine learning people, we all know that machine learning algorithm is very different from a standard you know, matrix factorization, um, a standard uh, uh, linear system simulation algorithm. It has a loss function. It has an algorithm that is uh, driving the minimization of the loss function. And uh, such iteration usually are resistant to small noises. We call them iterative convergent algorithms. And also, machine learning algorithms has a structure, such as uh, what's shown here. Then these structures are not uniform. There are some <coughs> components which are stronger, strongly dependent. Some are weakly dependent. And uh, if you want to make use of that, you probably can divide the bigger problem into a smaller one. So if you have a system which can take advantage of uh, this uh, little you know, uh, you know, uh, insight in machine learning programs, 
then there's a good chance for you to develop you know, a system that is uh, general purpose and uh, serving a wide range of goals. So with that, I want to close by summarizing you know, the bigger picture of the system. It is really trying to you know, build this so-called thin risk between the zoo of all machine learning algorithms and a zoom of all hardware systems to build a virtualization of uh, you know, one from each other. So that uh, you, know, you don't have to you know, look into the details of your hardware setup or a specific uh, layout of your algorithm. You can basically make use of this, uh, what we call the workhorse you know, algorithm building blocks and also the modules in the system such as from the server and the scheduler to hopefully get uh, you know, a homogeneous and uh, universal advantage you know, over a sequential execution of the same program. You may not get 100% you know, optimal efficiency, but at least you can get across the board you know, a good amount of uh, speed up you know, using this system. So, and uh, just as of uh, morning today, we actually released a new version of the Python system I just talked about, uh, which actually include the code for uh, the Prompt server, the scheduler, and a few uh, large-scale algorithms, both as demo and also as workhorse that you want to use for your real data. And you're welcome to download the code and play with that from this site. And uh, I have some big numbers just to show you the contrast of uh, what is enabled in Python and what is happening elsewhere. And uh, with that, I want to close and uh, take questions. <clears throat> yes? So um, you mentioned the output coding um, mm -hmm. briefly, but I was wondering if you could tell me how it differs from other output coding uh, schemes, like the um, random projections that John Langford did or the original Detroit one. Um, let's see. Uh, Random, the, the, the random matrix projection, uh, random projection is about uh, projecting the feature into that. You can, you can do output coding random projections as well. Okay, then you know, in, in, in the high level design philosophy they are similar, but in here of course every bit predictor can be trained. And also the design of the code actually is uh, subject to your own optimization. You can design a code so that they reflect the labeling structure you know, in the classification problem, which gives you a lot of flexibility. Yes. How does what? Uh, label assignments affect the performance. How does label assignments? Yes, like you kind of longer the label, longer the label. How does it affect the performance? Oh, okay. You mean the design of the coding matrix? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it affects. I don't have a systematic uh, kind of a study of how they affect, but. Uh, by intuition, you want to make the coding to, dis to display a number of features. One is that uh, they should uh, be redundant enough so that you have uh, error tolerance against uh, random noise. And separately, uh, secondly, they should have a good separability. That different classes shouldn't just be separated by one bit. 